How's it going guys, and welcome to the world of Dragon Age. Dragon Age is a huge game spanning three games and multiple add-ons. But even with all that time and multiple playthroughs, there still might be a few things that you may have missed. Little details, theories, facts, or interactions that might be not too well known. Well I'm here to try to unearth them today with 10 facts you may not have known about Dragon Age Origins specifically in Ostagar. So let's get right in with number one. The first thing we learn about Ostagar comes from Duncan when we're first running in. We learn that it was built by the Deventer Imperium to keep out the Wilders, which are the Chastened, and that also that the Grey Wardens used it as a final stand, and that it's fitting that we use this. But what you might not know is that Ostagar had not been used for 300 years prior to the Fifth Blight that takes place for the hero for Elden. And the Wilders that were used to chase out were actually the Chastened, which were much more numerous during the reign of the Tevinter Imperium. The very fact that this ruin still stands and it can be used for war is a true testament to the Dwarvers who built it and the power of the Tevinter Imperium during this time. Coming in at number two, we can't talk about Ostagar about the most important building to the player, the Tower of Ashal. Tower of Ashal is named after Ashal who was the Archon during the time of Ostagar's construction. An Archon is basically the de facto king of the Deventer Imperium, and considering how leaders are decided by who is the most powerful politically and magically, Ishal must have been quite a powerful dude considering the Deventer Imperium during this time spread throughout the entire Thetis. Additionally, when we find at the top of the tower, we can notice that it's incredibly numerous with incredible details to the bottom and very wide open. While it's used as a beacon now, it's very likely that the top of this tower was used as a sort of throne room for Ishal, back when he was alive, of course. A bonus theory about the Tower of Ishal is that we learn a lot from the Tower Guard during the daylight hours of Ostagar, who is a soldier of Loghain, and he tells us that it was built by the dwarves, but also that he mentions some lower levels of the Tower of Ishal that they're currently being investigated. However, when we press about these further, he acts like he didn't even know about them, almost as if he wasn't supposed to talk about them. Well, we do confirm that these lower levels are real in the Return to Ostagar DLC. In fact, it's these very tunnels that the Darkspawn used during the Battle of Ostagar to invade the Tower of Ishal. Now, so it makes it very convenient that Loghain's soldiers did not report these tunnels at all to Kaelin or Duncan. Well, my theory is, and this is not confirmed in the game, that Loghain did know about these tunnels because the soldier reported to, to him, but he told them to keep it under wraps, which also explains why the guard's attitude is a little bit dismissive about the tunnels. This is so his plan for betrayal later on could likely go more without a hitch, as it could easily have said that the tunnels are the reason why this flare didn't go off. At number three, we have the Ash Warriors. For a small group that chased into Nostagoskar, featuring dogs and are acting like scouts. Now, we learn a bit about them through talking with their leader that they are based off Dwarven Berserkers. In fact, if you're playing a Dwarf, they can even tell you their own history a bit, implying that there's a deep connection between the Dwarves and these guys. Now, something we don't learn about this leader, however, is the deep connection between the Ash Warriors, the Grey Wardens, and the Legion of the Dead. See, many Ash Warriors are actually former criminals who are either going to be executed or imprisoned for life. However, they are recruited into the Ash Warriors instead and their records are almost completely destroyed or sealed. Which is very similar to how the Legion of Dead or Grey Wardens operate. As once they go into the Order, they never come back and their past is completely absolved. This also explains the Ash Warriors fighting style as they fight like berserkers, and the leader even states that they fight like every battle is their last, and they're not afraid of death. Either way, the Ash Warriors are severely undercover, despite the Legion of the Dead and Grey Wardens in later games, and I would hope that we get this solved by either a companion or a DLC or something in the future. At number 4 we have Pick, the elven messenger running around Ostagar. He has a unique sword called Sir Garland's Sword. Through dialogue, you convince him that you're supposed to deliver an item of his. And through a persuasion check or high cunning, you can have your very own sword of your own. 
funnily enough, you can also kill him and take the sword off of him. And also in the description of the sword, it reads that this knight will now have to use his fork in the Battle of Ostagar. The sword gives a plus two attack and 10% physical resistance. And it's a generally a pretty good sword, especially this early on. Halfway through at number five, let's talk about pickpocketing. There are plenty of soldiers all around the camp that you can pickpocket. Even on the Quartermaster, there's a unique belt called Hardy's Belt that gives one constitution. It's pretty good. However, this was probably all known. Now what you might not know is a tiny detail, is that if you steal from one of the soldiers but get caught, a knight will approach Dun Duncan, accusing you of the theft. Duncan will take your side in the argument, but take your side after, and tell you that while he doesn't have a problem with it, you should refrain from using your skills and getting caught. You can even pickpocket Duncan and Alistair, though that requires especially a high cunning to do. Our next three facts will be about the different companions you acquire in Ostagar. First off is Davith, a rogue and fellow Grey Worn recruit who tries to give off a roguish charm and boast about his skills of stealth and thievery. Well, after he joins your party, you can learn a bit more about his past. He has spent the last six years as a wanted thief in Denerim, picking locks, pickpocketing, and even playing to be deadly with a dagger. In fact, he was recruited into the Grey Wardens by pickpocketing Duncan, but then getting caught by the guards, where he was conscripted by Duncan himself. Now what's funny about all this, however, is despite all this boasting Davith does, he is actually pretty useless when it comes to roguish traits. He can't pickpocket, he has low cunning, which makes him unable to open any locks in the Kokari Wilds. His only real roguish trait is the fact that he can stealth, which proves... Eh, moderately useful. Alas, while he isn't the most useful, he at least tries to provide some witty banter to make up for it. Next up is Jory, and there isn't as much to say about his personality as Davith. The only real character traits we get out of him is that he loves honor, and he, and he drills into our heads that he has a wife all the way in high ever. Kinda reminds me of that kid in high school who dates that cheerleader from that school you haven't heard about. Nevertheless, this detail is surrounding Jory's death, as during the joining, he refused to actually drink the darkspawn blood, and tries to escape before being promptly stabbed to death by Duncan. Now, when you bring this up to Duncan, he makes it seem like he had to kill Jory more of self-defense than anything else. But if we take a look at Jory, it seems more so like he's trying to defend Duncan off, rather than kill him. Plus, he really proves no real threat to Duncan anyway. Well, the actual reason for his death is he had learned what the joining of the Wardens entails, and to protect Warden's secrets from getting out to the public, he had to put Jory down. Our last, but certainly not least companion fact is about man's best friend, the Mabari Hound, who you can name anything from Rex to Fluffy to George Bush. Now, almost everyone knows that all you have to do to acquire him is to fetch a flower from the Kokari Wilds and give it back to the Dogmaster in Ostagar where after the battle, he'll promptly join your party. Now, if you forget this quest, however, but have the Return to Ostagar DLC, you can actually get another chance to get your Faithful Hound, as you find him fending off waves of Darkspawn in the camp that you left him in. Now, I've saved the longest for last, but I have a little disclaimer first. These aren't really details or definitive in the game, but more so two very large theories backed up by a lot of evidence. So feel free to disagree with them on your own, but I am going to make my best case to prove these theories. For our number 9 slot, we'll take a look at the War Council at, right after we take our joining. The Council features the major characters in the battle for Ostagar. However, there is two members joining that seem a bit out of place, particularly Uldred. Now Uldred is a major character in the Circle of Magi Crest, and I will definitely delve deeper into him there. Now, the only thing Aldred actually says during the War Council is saying how lighting the Tower of Ashal is unnecessary and that he is an alternative. But before he can finish, the revered mother dismisses this suggestion. Now, at first, this is easy to ignore as we can chop the scene off to just another time the Chantry forbids mages from being mages. However, from what we learn later on, this scene may highlight a deeper meaning. You see, we learn from the so called Magi Crest that Aldred and Loghain are in an alliance, and directly after the Battle of Ostagar, Uldred heads back to the Circle to convince the mages to join Loghain's cause. Loghain, in return, promises to give the Circle more freedom. Now, we don't know how long these two have been working together, 
but it's safe to assume here that they made this alliance prior to the Battle of Ostagar. Now, knowing that his interest in the Tower of Rishal take on a deeper meaning, we can start to see why he actually wanted to make the suggestion, as guess whose men are actually guarding the tower to defend themselves? Loghain's. And guess who's planning to retreat in a battle, leaving his men in that said tower to defend for themselves? That's right, Loghain. Aldred isn't interested in the tower himself, but Loghain probably asked this favor of him so that Loghain could pull his men out of the tower, both to send men lord to him and to spare some lives in the coming battle. It's also fair to assume that whatever Aldred's suggestion was to signal Loghain would have intentionally failed as Loghain wants to make Kaelin's death seem as much of an accident as possible. Now again, we don't know this for sure, but yeah, there's definitely something more going on here. Finally, for our last spot, we're going to take a look at the council again, but this time focusing on Kaelin and Alistair, two really important characters that I've completely neglect neglected so far in this video. Now we learn later on in the story that Alistair is actually the bastard son of Merrick, who is Kaelin's father, which makes them half brothers. Now, Kaelin isn't actually supposed to know that Alistair is related to him. Only the people closest to Merrick, like Al Eamon or Loghain, actually know that Alistair is related to him. We know that Duncan knows because Alistair told him, but it's never referenced or told anywhere that Kaelin knows that Alistair is related to him. What makes this odd, however, is Kaelin specifically names Alistair to go with the hero of Ferelden to the tower which at the time is considered a much safer place than the front lines. Even if you insist that you can handle this on your own, Kaelin seems very oddly insistive that Alistair goes in as well. Now I don't have a definitive answer as to why, but I do have two possibilities. The first is that Kaelin knew Alistair as his half-brother and heir, or at least had a hunch and wanted him safe in the tower just in case the worst to, was to come in the battle. The second option is much less interesting, and it was basically just Bioware shoehorning Alistair to survive the battle because Alistair is almost like the second main character in Dragon Age Origins. I'm choosing to lean towards the first option as it's much more interesting, but let me know if you guys have any theories yourselves. Now thank you all so much for watching, this video is something new I'm doing, so any support you guys and gals can provide by likes or comments is very much appreciated. If you have any theories about Dragon Age that you think are less known, I'd love to read them in the comments. My next video will be on Lovering, and I hope to catch you all there, but for now, have a great day.